Welcome to another episode of the Notes Live. I'm your host Aishwarya, and today we will be discussing transport and plants. And we have Afreen with us. Over to you, Afreen. Hello, everyone. So, like Aishwarya said, we're discussing IGCC Biology Chapter Eight, that is transport and plants. Uh, the first part is xylem and phloem. So these are basically the two main vessels in plants. So the syllabus states that you need to know the functions of these two vessels and you need to be able to identify them in different diagrams uh, and in different parts of the plants. Uh, and then you have to be able to relate the structure of these vessels to their functions. So there are just three main points for that part, which we will look into later. So let's get started. First of all, what's xylem and phloem? Xylem and phloem are the two main vessels that transport nutrients in throughout the plant. We have already discussed this. Um, the xylem is responsible for transport of water and mineral ions, as well as supporting the plant. While the phloem, the phloem vessel, it's responsible for the transport of sucrose and amino acids. So these are two different vessels. They contain two different um, sorts of nutrients and they are different in composition and also in positions in diagrams, as you'll see now. So if you look at the first picture, that's the root, you'll see how the phloem and the xylem is situated. So the xylem is in the center, that's the um, plus sign kind of thing, that's the xylem, while the four circles, so the four oval shaped thingies uh, at the edge are the phloems. So usually you'll try to think about like this, the outer thing is the phloem, while the inner part is the xylem. So you'll see that trend in the next picture too, that's the stem. If you look at it, the red part inside those small oval uh, thingies, there's the red and the blue. So the red is the xylem vessel, while the blue is the phloem vessel. So you'll see the two, of, to the two different plants, root and stem, they have that similar pattern. The xylem is on the inside, while the phloem is on the outside. Don't try this in the paper. It's just a little trick that I use to um, learn uh, to be able to identify these in the diagrams. So it's a little tip here, but you need to be able to state that, OK, so that is the phloem and this is the xylem. Don't say the one on the inside is the xylem, the one on the outside is phloem, because it's not going to make sense and the examiner might not give you marks for that. Now we go to the third image. Uh, it's the leaf. So this one kind of defies the trend because there's nothing really outside or inside here. It's just the, the top part and the bottom part. So you can say uh, over here, you kind of have to learn it. The, the top part is phloem and the bottom part is xylem. So always remember when you're learning it, when you're making notes, try to color code it. So like in these images, like in these diagrams, the blue part is phloem and the red part is xylem. And when you keep looking at it, you get a hang of it and then you just know it by heart. So the next part is the structure and function of xylem vessels. So you need to know more about the xylem vessels in a little more detail. So first point you need to know is that xylem have uh, xylem vessels have thick walls which are made of lignin and you don't need to know the details of this part. You just have to know that the walls are thick and it's made of lignin. The second part, the second point that you need to know is that these the cells have no cell content except for maybe a little bit of cytoplasm and that's about it and then the next part is the cells are joined end to end with no cross walls to form a continue long continuous tube so if you'll remember from a previous chapter foam vessels have a sieve kind of structure in between the vessels transportation while for xylem vessels the transportation happens only in one direction and there's no sieve kind of uh, barricades or barriers. It's just one long hollow tube uh, for continuous movement of water. So that, that's, what it, that's what's different about the phloem apart from the contents itself, uh, is the structure. So xylem vessels are one long hollow tube while the phloem vessels have separations uh, made by these walls of dead remains of the cells but you don't need to know the details of that. Okay, so that was the first part. Now we go to the second part. The second part is an extension of the first part. That is, this is water uptake. So like I said, uh, water is transported in the xylem vessels. So in this part, the syllabus needs you to know uh, what is a root hair cell and you need, to, you need to be able to state its functions and its adaptations. And you need to know the 
path taken by water from the root to the leaves and then how it exits the plant. And then, yeah, that's about it. The second, the last part is a paper six question. You'll be able to figure that out uh, by the end of this part. Okay, so first of all, this is the root hair cell. The large surface area of root hair cell increases the uptake of water and mineral ions. So when you look at this um, extension to the nor ordinary looking plant cell, you should know that the function of this extension is to increase the surface area. And when you think about extended surface area, you will think about um, maximum absorption of water and mineral ions. Over here, you note that the root hair cells have no chloroplast because first of all, it's underneath the ground. So there's no sunlight reaching the plant, uh, thus the, that, that part of the plant, and thus there's no photosynthesis happening. So chloroplasts are not required. Um, so that's why that part of the plant, the roots are not green. It's because of the absence of the chloroplast. Um, like I said, it's long. It has a large surface area so that most of the maximum absorption of water is possible uh, and also maximum absor absorption of mineral ions. So these uh, nutrients are transported in the xylem vessels. Like I said, the xylem vessel, uh, the xylem vessel transports water and mineral ions. So that was the root hair cell. So the, <clears throat> the root hair cell is basically the first step in the plant that the water goes through and then it just is transported throughout the plant to the leaf and then outside the leaf, which is what we will discuss here, the pathway of the water. Water enters root hair cell via, mo uh, via osmosis. Osmosis is the movement of water particles from a high concentration to low concentration. We have done this and uh, this, osmosis is possible because water potential is higher in soil than in cytoplasm. So the water tries to move from high water potential to low water potential to, in order to reach an equilibrium. Uh, however, this equilibrium is never really reached because the water is constantly um, evaporating from the leaf. So there's always a deficiency of water. That's why uh, osmosis is constantly occurring so that there's always a supply of water to the plant. Um, water passes through the cortex cells by osmosis, but mostly by suction. Now, this suction is created because of a process known as transpiration. This is something we will look into in the further in the coming slides. Um, you don't need to know what's a cortex cell. This is an extra bit of information, but you just have to know that water passes through the plant uh, by osmosis and mostly by suction. The suction happens because of a process called transpiration water and minerals are forced to cross the uh, endomers, endodermis. So this is again, an extra information, not really something you need to know at this level. But once again, these it's really to uh, reinforce that it's water and minerals. We're not looking at amino acids and sucrose here because that's another process we will look into later. And then the last part is water enters xylem that leaves and then it gets to uh, when it gets to the mesophyll cells. Like I said, the final destination in the plant is the leaf. So it goes from the root hair cell to the along the stems and along the um, veins of the leaf to get to the leaf, the cells of the leaf, where uh, respiration and photosynthesis can occur. That that's really the purpose of what the water. Okay, so transpiration. Like I said water is moving along the plant because of a suction motion created by transpiration. So we will look at what is transpiration here. So first of all, the syllabus needs you to know what is transpiration and how water evaporates from the surface of the leaves. And then you look at why, why water evaporates. And we'll look at the, a little bit into detail about the, mechanisms of the uh, mechanism of the process. And then we'll look at um, effect of ex external um, environmental changes of that, that has the effects of external um, changes on the rate of transpiration. And then we will look at why wilting occurs. Wilting, um, yeah, it's just slightly related to this. First of all, transpiration is the loss of water vapor from the leaves. So this is a very basic definition. You need to memorize this. This could come in paper four, paper two, paper six as well, maybe, but really don't take it, take it chances. It's a simple definition, learn it water transpiration is the loss of water vapor from the leaves uh keyword water vapor you have to mention the vapor if you just say water it 
the examiner may or may not accept the answer. So mention water vapor to stay safe. And the next point is water evaporates from the surfaces of the mesophyll cells into the air spaces and then diffuses out of the leaf through the stomata as water vapor. So water evaporates from the mesophyll cells. So if you remember the structure of the leaf, the top part is the mesophyll cells and the bottom part uh, has air spaces. So basically the water evaporates from the mesophyll cells into the air spaces where um, excess gases are stored or waste gases are stored. And these gases are waiting, basically waiting to exit the leaf through the stomata. Stomata are basically entryways to the leaf. These are tiny holes that are opened and closed by the guard cells. This was discussed in another, in the previous chapter. So yeah, you should probably revise that before coming here. So yes. Water is used up in the mesophyll cells and the excess or the waste is evaporated into the air spaces that through which, uh, from which it evaporates through the stomata. The water vapor loss is related to the large internal surface area provided by the interconnecting air spaces between the mesophyll cells and the size and number of stomata. So like I said, the, the stomata has a very large surface area, <clears throat> which allows for water to evaporate quickly uh, and so that as the water evaporates quickly the, su the suction motion is created because water is cohesive in nature so when some of the water leaves it kind of pulls the water in another part of the plant forward uh, to bring it to the leaf to make up for the absence of the water that that's not there you know what I mean this water is constantly needed so as soon as the some of the previous the old water leaves leaf there's a demand for some more water so which comes from the stem or whatever basically through the pathway that was taken by the water from the root cell to the leaf and this is why transpiration is so important because it basically facilitates the whole process of uptake of water this is the most important process here because without this um, transport of water would not be as efficient if it was possible at all so yeah yeah that's about it okay the next part is wilting wilting occurs if water loss is greater than water uptake like i said when water evaporates it creates demand for more water but what happens if that demand is not met um the cells become flaccid the tissues become limp and the plant is no longer supported so basically the look if you look think about the plant cell and the vacuole vacuole is basically a very very large relatively large space that contains water so when it's full it gives the cell a robust shape however when it's empty the cell loses that robustness it loses uh, it's no longer rigid and uh, full it becomes smaller and um, it starts to limp which may and when it's happening in a larger scale when it's happening to many uh, cells it happens to the entire plant and that's where you'll notice the plant starts to wilt but as soon as you give it some water, as soon as you water the plant, you'll see that the water supply has been replenished. So the plant is no longer wilting. Okay, so once again, we're looking at uh, uptake of water. We looked at the path pathway of water. Now we're looking at the uptake of water. Once again, very important process in this is transpiration. Okay, so the uptake of water is caused by water loss in the leaves. Like I said, that's transpiration. When that happens, the water potential is lowered. And then the water moves from xylem to leaf tissues, once again, via osmosis. Whenever you see uh, anything about to do with movement of water, it's always osmosis, because that's the, that's the way uh, water moves from one part to another. That's osmosis. Water moves up the stem in the xylem due to tension. Tension is basically because of the cohes cohesive nature of water, water molecules. So when like I said, when this part of the water moves, this part will try to follow it, basically. It's like, it's, it's kind of like a magnet, but th don't think of it that way, really. It's something to just clear the, the concept. But yes, th that's basically what's happening. And then the whole process basically ends with the gain of water through the roots. So you think about it this way. The water is leaving the plant through the leaf, and as while that is happening, simultaneously water is entering the plant 
through the roots. So it's a constant cycle. It's a constant process that's always happening. And it could be hindered by many factors, by many external um, environmental conditions, which we will look at uh, later. But this uh, upward flow of water so from the root to the leaf, it's called the transpiration stream. Okay, here's the external factors that I was talking about, the factors affecting rate of transpiration. So there's three main factors that you need to know for IGCC biology. There's temperature, humidity, and light intensity. So the first factor is temperature. Higher temperatures increase water holding capacity of air, and then it increases the transpiration rate. So it's basically what's written here. Higher temperature <clears throat> increases the water. It increases how much water can be carried by the air and so since that's happening more water can in leave the leaf so more water is exiting the leaf so the rate of transpiration increases so higher the temperature higher the rate of transpiration okay next point is humidity low humidity increases the water potential gradient between leaf and the atmosphere what this basically means is water potential is lower in the air than the leaf so like I, if you remember osmosis, water moves from high water potential to low water potential. So if the air has low water potential, water moves from the leaf to the air. So it's a natural movement, no energy required. And that's why when the humidity is lower, rate of transpiration increases. So high humidity, transpiration rate decreases. It's uh, inverse related, uh, inversely related. Next point is light intensity. High light intensity causes stomata to open more often, which increases the rate of transpiration. Why does high light intensity cause stomata to open? To increase the rate of photosynthesis. So if you remember when the light intensity is higher, rate of photosynthesis is also higher. Similarly, when the light intensity is higher, rate of transpiration is higher because the stomata is opening more often and for longer periods of time. So water has more time to exit the leaf. And that's about that. So now we'll look at the last part. This is translocation. Um, 8.4 of this chapter, this part four of chapter eight. Uh, this is only extended. So if you're doing the core curriculum, this part is not important for you, but if you're going for the extended version, you have to know this part. So first of all, you need to know what is translocation and you need to know the, you need to be able to describe some of the specifics of this process and you need to be able to describe why the sink and the source are changing in different times of the year we will look at what is the sink and the source now so first of all part location is the movement of sucrose and amino acids in phloem from sources to sinks so we've talked about transpiration we've talked about water we've talked about xylem vessels and that was that now we're looking at the phloem vessels and what's transported in phloem vessels it's the sucrose and the amino acids. So translocation is the movement of sucrose and amino acids in phloem, phloem vessels. You have to be, you have to make sure you mention that part from sources to sinks. This is a definition. You need to memorize this. Could come, it could come as a direct question for like two marks. Um, it could come in paper two as a multiple choice. You can't really predict this one because it's so straightforward. It's just easier to learn it. It will also help you. It will also like strengthen your theory. So it's better off if you you're better off to learn it. Now sources to sinks. Sources is basically where the sucrose and amino acids are made, and sinks are the part of the plant where it's used. Uh, it's sort of self-explanatory, but we'll look at it here. Sources are parts of the plant that release sucrose and amino acid. Sinks are parts of the plant that use or store sucrose and amino acids. Now, if you if you look at some plants like tubers, potato plants, uh, sucro, starch is stored and then you can, and sometimes the start, the stores become smaller because they are the sources. Okay, we'll look at that later, but first of all, you need to know in a, for example, pot, potato plant, the leaf, they are the sources and the potato itself, the tubers are the sinks because sucrose, is, uh, sucrose and amino acids are released from the leaf and they're stored in the tubers. So that, that should help you understand what's a source and what's a sink. Translocation in different seasons. Now, translocation happens, uh, the source and the sink changes depending on the season. 
now photosynthesis would be greatest in the summer because of maximum sunlight, maximum temperature. All of these are really favorable for photosynthesis to occur. So that's why you notice in th this season, plants are the sources while the tubers are the sinks. However, if you go to monsoon seasons, the rainy seasons or winter, um, it's, it's cloudier, it's darker, it's colder. It's not the best time for plants to grow. So you'll notice that the sources are the tubers because they've been storing the sucrose and amino acids, right? So now the, these, this, this part of the plant is releasing these nutrients to the rest of the plant to keep the plant alive and healthy at, at least long enough so that the season changes. And once again, the leaves can start photosynthesizing and the tubers can start storing these nutrients in times of in case of um, unfavorable conditions so let's look here spring the first that's the first line spring sucrose transported from stores in roots to leaf so sucrose is in the spring sucrose is transported from the roots to the leaf so the roots are the source here however in summer and early autumn Sucrose goes from photosynthesizing leaf to root stores. So this is basically what I just explained. When the conditions are favorable, the sources are the leaves and they transport nutrients to the stores. And it's vice versa when the conditions are not favorable. So that's translocation. And I think that's it. Let's look at some questions. So this is May, June 2018. A student is investigating the effect of temperature on the rate of transpiration. Which environmental conditions should be kept constant during this investigation? Okay, so we're looking at rate of transpiration, the effect of temperature on the rate of transpiration. So in these questions, you should know that only the only thing that should that should be changing is the 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 condition itself, while everything else should be constant. So the correct answer would be everything should be cons constant except for the temperature, which is option B. Okay, so this is October, November, 2017. What is the function of translocation? To move leaf towards the light for photosynthesis? Nope. To move water into leaves for photosynthesis? Nope. To transport amino acids for the growth of new leaf? To transport starch to all parts of the plant? So you can, you can get confused between part C, uh, option C and D. However, it is option D because amino acids are not really required because when the plant is struggling, it's not really going to grow a new leaf because the focus is going to be to survive. So the logical answer would be to transport starch to all parts of the plant because this is starch is what's really required to survive. And that's when you'll notice some parts don't really grow in off seasons. Yeah, that's that's basically that. OK, what is a description of transpiration? Exchange of gases between the leaf and the atmosphere atmosphere loss of water vapor from leaves and stem of a plant, movement of water from the roots to the leaf, movement of water through the cells of the leaf. So this is right of the get-go, you should be able to know. You see loss of water, you should think about transpiration. So what is the best description of transpiration? Loss of water vapor. That, that's really the answer. Nothing to explain here. And yeah, that's IGC Biology Chapter 8, Transport in Plants. Where I think we're here. Okay, thank you, Afrin, for your time today. And the both of us hope that you had a better understanding of transport and plants after watching this lesson. And our social media handles will be appearing on the next slide, so you can follow them. Thank you so much.